Fora TV. The world is thinking. Good evening and welcome to Kepler's and thanks for coming tonight to a, a really wonderful event that we have. I'm Bobby Emmel and I'm the host for tonight's event. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in the in the audience and um, uh, just wanted to again welcome you on a Wednesday night to Kepler's, your favorite independent community bookstore, aren't we? <laughs> so I want to I want to give my usual pitch and thanks to our literary circle members who uh, really without those folks we can't have events like this and so um, because you are all such great supporters of Kepler's um, I would really encourage you if you're not a literary circle member yet that's one of the best ways to support us and keep us here in the community is to become a literary circle member so just um, ask any of our staff or we've got some uh, brochures around that you can look and see what the benefits are to you as well as to Kepler's and another great way to keep uh, events like this coming to Kepler's is to buy the book so uh, we really would hope that you would uh, take a look at the uh, the book that we're featuring tonight uh, that Mr. Lobdell will be speaking about as well as some of our other fine selections so uh, um, oh, I, I also want to mention that we do have um, this camera over here is uh, from foratv.com and uh, if you want to take a look at their website it's foratv, F-O-R-A-T-V.com and they'll be uh, filming no some dot of our no.com no .com. Fora.tv, my bad. Fora.tv, F-O-R-A.tv. And they're going to be filming some of our events here, and they have a lot of different speakers and events that are on their website. You might want to take a, take a look at Fora.tv. Um, we have a great event coming up tomorrow night as well, if you'd like to come on back. We have um, Nicolette Hahn Nyman uh, talking about her book, Righteous Pork Chop, Finding a Life and Good Food Beyond Factory Farms. That's tomorrow at 7.30. Okay, and now for tonight's uh, event. Um, I think probably many of you have seen me uh, host events before, and so you know my usual story that, you know, I've got my stack of books that I have all the time, and it's really hard for me to get through um, all of these books, and I try, but I often don't succeed. But sometimes a book really grabs me, and I get that, you know, stay up late every night until I finish this book urge. And uh, the book that we're featuring tonight, uh, William Lobdell's uh, first book, Losing My Religion, is one of those books. Um, his story of searching for religion, finding it, and then losing or actually letting go of it again is similar to my own journey, and I, and I really suspect that of many others. However, an important difference between Mr. Lobdell's work and the writing of others on this subject is his ability to maintain a journalist's objectivity even while reporting on his own story. There's no mockery here and no anger at God or institutions except for some well-placed outrage concerning the Catholic priest's sexual abuse scandal which Mr. Lobdell covered for the LA Times. Instead, we're privy to watching one person pursuing what many would call one of the conditions of being human, the search for purpose and ways to interpret the events that happen around us. Mr. Lobdell bravely lets us in on his roller coaster ride of spiritual highs and lows. And although I'm glad he was able to eventually get off of the roller coaster, I have to admit to being disappointed late one night to find that I had finished his book and there was no more of his clear writing and personal poignant story to follow. And I really hope that there will be a sequel. Mr. Uh, Lobdell has been a journalist for the last 25 years and ended a long tenure with the LA Times in 2007, and he's currently on the visiting faculty at UC Irvine. Please welcome Bill Lobdell. That was a very nice introduction, thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. Um, in recent weeks, I've, I've spoken to um, a church packed full of uh, conservative evangelicals, um, and I spoke to uh, just the other day to a auditorium full of um, kind of arrogant atheists who wondered how it took me um, 48 years until I got what they figured out at age eight. Um, but this is my toughest crowd because I have this is the first time I'm speaking in front of my family, so I'm uh, I'm very nervous. Um, 
my, you know, my story starts out, I'm, uh, I was in my mid-20s, and uh, my life was a wreck. I had married a uh, crazy high school sweetheart. Um, there's a lesson there. Most of you are older, but uh, any young, youngsters out there, don't do that. And, um, I, um, and I'd, got, I'd gotten a girl pregnant that I was dating. Oh, I didn't divorce my wife because she was so crazy I didn't want to deal with it. So um, then I got a girl pregnant. My career was in the, uh, um, was stalled out at a, at a lousy uh, magazine. And um, I was in a big depression. And I did what most American males did is I, is I didn't tell anybody and uh, put on a front that uh, everything was good. And uh, finally a friend of mine said, you know, what is wrong with you? And so I just poured out my heart. I go, this is what's wrong, blah, 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 blah. And I thought he'd hate me. And he said, uh, you know what's missing in your life, Bill, is God. you got to go find God. And at the time, he could have said crack cocaine, and I would have been, you know, <laughs> went out behind the uh, restaurant and done it with him. Uh, but he said God, so he picked me up and took me to church. And he took me to a mega church. And I'd grown up a, um, a minor league Catholic, Episcopalian. And um, I... Um, in, in growing up, you'd go to church, and it's very ritualistic. There wasn't a lot of talk about uh, or study of the Bible. I was basically Bible illiterate. Um, and, um, and I went into this church, and um, the music, instead of an organ, there was a, a really tight rock band. And, um, and instead of a sermon, there was this, it was a message um, from a very charismatic guy that, that um, uh, brought together biblical truth with, with everyday life. It was just spellbounding. Um, the people were attractive. Everybody was so, they looked so good and they were so happy and there was a lot of hugs. I don't like hugs, um, but you know, everybody hugs you. And, um, and out on the patio, instead of those um, kettle drums of coffee, there was lattes. And uh, I thought, wow, this is a great church. You know, it's like a country club. And uh, so I, I really dove in because I found um, I was fascinated with the Bible. I was fascinated with uh, Christianity. Um, I had, I, I got a whole new group of friends, and uh, um, and my life started to change around. You know, I started to uh, um, mature quite a bit, and um, and I had a, a good friend. Um, I think he's on the radio up here, Hugh Hewitt. He's one of those conservative, crazy talk show hosts on the radio, and um, he told me, and he's a big evangelical Christian. He said, "You know what? To complete your." sort of the first part of your journey, you got to go on a, a retreat, a Christian retreat. And this is, um, if you haven't been on a retreat, it's like, you know, for me it was like 95 strangers up in some Spartan quarters where you're sleeping with 10, 10 men in a room with all kinds of bodily sounds all night long. And, um, uh, and you pray, you, um, you have a speaker, and you have these, uh, and you sing. It's kind of my version of hell, I thought. And, um, but then the most important part is you have these testimonies. And these, these men who were um, leaders of the community would get up there and they'd give these tearful testimonies about how you know, there's some failure in their life and it was only through God and through Jesus that they got on the right track. And it was amazing the, the barriers that were broken down in these, um, at, at this weekend. So at the, um, at the final day of the weekend, um, they, have the, they have this church service. And so I'll, I'll read just uh, what happened to me there. After the music, Mike Barris, a pastor-to-be who conducted the climatic Sunday morning service, asked the men gathered in the chapel a simple question that I should have anticipated but hadn't. Have you publicly pronounced Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I hadn't. I wasn't ready to. Panicked, my pulse quickened, my eyes darted. I felt trapped. I didn't want to be a born-again Christian. I knew what I thought of them, and I knew what people less tolerant of, of, of I thought of them. Um, I couldn't even say Jesus in public. The weekend had been such a great spiritual, spiritual experience. Why did Barris have to wreck it by forcing this born-again question on me? My walls quickly came back up. I needed more time to warm up to the idea of being called born again. Barris went on to say that a public profession of faith or confession, sorry, um, of faith was an important part of the Christian journey. He asked us to bow our heads, close our eyes, and pray. In a gentle voice, he felt, he told those who felt moved to accept Christ into their heart today to raise their hand. My heart beat even faster, but no longer in self-defense. I couldn't believe it, but I felt an urge to raise my hand. But I sure didn't want to be the only one. I took a peek around the room and saw several hands shoot up. What was I going to do? My eternal fate might rest on this decision. Uh, maybe not, said another voice inside my head. This whole born-again thing could just be a bunch of crap. 
I shut my eyes and prayed. That seemed safe and non-committal. But there was that urge again to raise my hand. Was it from God? My heart beat. My heart threatened to beat out of my chest. I was at the edge of a cliff, weighing whether to jump. I wanted to take the plunge, but I didn't want to look to be looked at as a freak. I didn't want. I didn't know how to explain. I didn't know how to explain my conversion to my atheist friends. I, I didn't want to imagine how I would change once Jesus truly became the centerpiece of my life. Would I be wearing a rainbow wig and a handlebar mustache inside a football stadium? waving a John 3.16 sign at the television camera? Would I be compelled to walk away from material pleasures and devote my life to helping the poor? I didn't want to find out. Barris was very good at his job, not in any rush. He said he still felt there were others in the chapel who wanted to become Christians today. He waited a few more minutes in case anybody else wanted to raise his hand. Was he talking to me, I wondered, or was it God who was speaking? My pulse actually slowed as at last I obeyed. My arm seemed to float up on its own until it was over my head. Barris asked those of us who raised our hands to repeat the sinner's prayer, and then I say the prayer. Um, when I repeated the line, I invite Jesus into my heart, I experienced only what I could call a vision. Time slowed. In my mind's eye, my, my heart opened in halves, and a warm, glowing light flowed right in. As my heart melted back together, it remained illuminated with a soft light from the inside. I felt instantly the light was Jesus, who now lived inside me. A warm tingling um, spread across my chest. This I thought, no, I knew was what it was meant to be born again. So I had this sort of magical, mystical mountaintop experience, and, um, and my life's going much better, and I'm a journalist, and so I, I di so I dive even deeper into my Christian life, and I noticed that there's a big disconnect between what's reported in the mainstream media about um, religion and what's happening really in, in faith. You know, the mainstream media talks about um, writes constantly about knuckleheads like um, you know Pat Robertson or, or Jerry Falwell or abortion or homosexuality and and that's just sort of a, a sideshow I, I thought and but, but I was seeing these incredible stories um, dramatic stories of, of life change and, and um, conflict and it, and it was all centered around religion and so I thought um, uh, maybe it was God's calling for me to become a religion writer so um, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for years, like four years. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should do something um, <laughs> um, instead of just praying about it. So um, I met with the LA Times editors in Orange County, and I, and I said, uh, what if I told you there is, a, there is a group that has, that meets, um, that draws 15,000 people a weekend, um, and you've never covered, you, you, haven't, you haven't written one word about this group. And editors are, um, pretty arrogant people and uh, they said that's impossible that just can't happen we cover we cover this area really there's no way because it's like a, it's like it would be like a um, hockey game happening or a basketball game every weekend they didn't they missed it and I said well it's Saddleback Church it's one of the biggest churches in the nation and you guys just don't cover it and it's not because they're against Saddleback Church they didn't, just don't know about Saddleback Church um, uh, newsrooms are, are fairly godless places and um, there's not a lot of people that would, would recognize this as a really good story so she was intrigued. I handed her like 20 other story ideas. And so she said, you know what, why don't you go ahead and write a column for us um, and start whenever you can. So that began a, um, I thought God answered my prayers. And uh, I started writing these stories and they were, they were really good stories. Um, and they had, hadn't been in the paper before. I wrote, um, I'll give you one example. I wrote about a, a, a woman named Madge and Madge was a, uh, um, older, she was in her 70s and she was a church organist and she'd have to get up early in the morning because she had arthritic, arthritic fingers and so she'd go to Denny's, she'd get her cup of coffee and she would, she would kind of play the, the organ on the, uh, on the Formica counters and so she had to go to the bathroom, she's in the bathroom, uh, a man came in there, attacked her, attempted to rape her and kill her, um, slit her throat, beat her up and uh, she, so she's in the hospital, he gets caught, she's in the hospital and she tells her daughter, um, first thing she says is, I need a Bible and a highlight, highlighter pen. And uh, daughter goes, well, why? And she goes, well, when I was being attacked, I kept crying out to Jesus for help. And my attacker said, you know, Jesus won't help me. I'm really possessed by Satan. And so I need to help this man. So she, highlight, she spends her time in the hospital highlighting her Bible. When it came time for the preliminary, hear, preliminary hearing, um, she uh, asked the, a startled judge, can she give her attacker a present, a gift? And um, he said, okay. So she, she goes, here's a Bible. Jesus loves you. He, he, he'll be with you. 
I highlight this for you, I forgive you, and I do it because Jesus commands me to do it. And it began a very um, bizarre, very tight relationship between this attacker and, and this victim. Um, he ended up getting 27 years in prison, um, but, he, but she is set up, she's probably be dead by the time he gets out, but she's set up a whole support system for him when he gets out, a job, a mentor, a place to live. And she says it's only because of the, um, her, her Christian walk that she was able to do this. And so these are the types of stories I was doing. And I was getting a lot of um, recognition for them, and eventually the editor said, you know what, can you, can you please do this full time? And so I thought, wow, you know, God is faithful. I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm full time religion writer for the Times. That's what I prayed for, and um, and it was uh, and it was it was good, as it says in the Bible. Um, it was good, and for a couple of years it was really good. And then, right before the sex scandal um, broke out in Boston, there was one in our neck of the woods in, in Southern California, and it was this guy named um, Father Michael Harris, and he it, there, he was called Father Hollywood because he was this most charismatic priest in Southern California. He was principal of um, a high school that he raised $27 million single-handedly for to build. Um, he was everything to everybody. And uh, he was also, um, I have to say alleged because it never went to court, but he was a, allegedly a serial um, molester of his students. And he'd pick off the ones that were having troubles at home and, and molest them. Uh, so this one kid who, who was one of his victims, um, try to commit suicide. His parents rescued him at the last minute and said, you know, why would you commit suicide? He said, well, no one will believe me, but I was uh, molested by Father Harris. And the, the, his parents had gone, there was one other accusation that came, became public, and they went to a rally for Father Harris um, at a park, and they, had, they hired a plane that says, we heart Father Harris, and you know, the, whole, the whole community rallied around it. So this kid saw this and said, no one's going to believe me if I say this. So the um, so the parents, they were really great parents. They, they went to the um, bishop with his son and said, we, we want, and this is a familiar story now, but it wasn't then, you know, we, we just want three things. We want an apology, we want Harris out of ministry, and we want you to pay for our counseling bills because, um, you know, um, our son's very troubled. So the bishop, who had a, a long, um, long rap sheet from this Father Harris, he knew exactly what, who this guy was, said, you're lying, get out of my office, and you know, keep your mouth shut and don't bring shame to this church. So that started a lawsuit um, that five years later, remember they only wanted an apology and him out of office and the, you know, out of ministry and this um, counseling bills. They settled for um, $5.2 million and a whole bunch of set of new rules. Um, so I'm covering this case and they're having a press conference and my, my dark little journalistic heart, which is, is not little, it's big, and, um, and I'm looking at this guy, and he's 27 now. This happened like 12 years ago. And I'm thinking, $5.2 million? And he spent, you know, five years pursuing this? And why didn't he get on, get on with his life? And, you know, I'm just I'm kind of thinking all these thoughts. And um, so I'm, t I'm interviewing a, a victim's advocate, and I'm, you know, I'm asking her about the money. And I was trying to be objective, but apparently I wasn't. And she goes, you know what, Bill, why don't you come to a survivor's meeting? It, there's one tomorrow night. So I said, sure. So I went there, and in this, this uh, small room, there, were, um, there, was a, there was half a dozen uh, victims. And the only way to describe them, they reach in age from like 20 to 70. And the only way to describe them is that their, sh their souls have been shattered. Um, what they did, what happened to them, messed up um, them uh, sexually, spiritually, emotionally, at a very young age. They can never recover. and. Um, and the pain of the, and there are some parents there, the pain of the parents that kept putting these priests in the path of their kids because they thought the priests were helping and the kids would say, I don't like him, I don't want to go. And they kept putting this, this one woman, um, just to let you know the gravity of it, um, she was there, um, her name was Rita, and, she, and this priest picked her up every Tuesday night for um, religious training and they would take her to um, a, either the rectory or hotel and he and seven other priests would have their way with her. She's 14 years old. Um, she got pregnant and the priest uh, told the mom that she'd been a bad girl at school and was going to shame the family so she should be flown to the Philippines um, be, well, during her pregnancy and to give birth, where she almost died during childbirth. Um, so her mom was there and, and this, the anguish that this mom talked about um, 
it was when you're sitting there, you know, I just wanted to, to die because I, I just couldn't believe what was going on. So let me read you the next part of this book. Um, on the road to Damascus, a light from heaven blinded Saul of Taurus, who had been attacking Jews who believed Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He fell to the ground and heard God's voice ask, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Three days later, a disciple restored Saul's sight and baptized him. From that moment, Saul, with the new name Paul, dedicated his life to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, becoming one of history's most influential figures. I didn't have a sudden conversion, or rather deconversion, after meeting the sexual abuse survivors. But looking back, it now appears to me as a road to Damascus moment that I kept so safely locked away in my subconscious. I drove home, I drove in almost a trance. I had written so much about the redemptive power of faith that I had never seen in a real and personal way the opposite, the damage religion can do in the hands of bad people. I looked back on what I'd seen on the faith beat and started to wonder for the first time about the low level of holiness I was seeing. It was the reason why stories were so easy to spot. People of deep faith, real faith, shine brightly against the dullness of the spiritual pack. This short supply of holiness was something that began to stick in my throat, a disconcerting fact that I washed down with prayer and Christian aphorisms such as don't mix up man's shortcomings with God. It would take a lot of processing in several years for my conscious thinking to catch up to my gut. When I got home, I tried to tell my wife what I'd seen at the survivor's meeting, but it was impossible to properly put into words. The closest I could come was to say that these people had had their souls shattered and they'd never be whole again. I'd later run across a better description given by Father Thomas Doyle, whose career was stunted by church leaders after he became, in 1985, a leading advocate for victims of clergy sexual abuse. Molesting priests and their superiors, he said, were committing soul murder. Um, so right after, right after, six months after that story, the Boston scandal broke, and I was on the um, religion beat full time. Um, I went from my mega church, which um, is seeker friendly, you know, barely has a cross. You kind of have to look for um, the Christian message in it, and it was just too shallow for me, and I wanted more depth. So I was drawn to Catholicism. And I love the 2,000-year history. I love the, the writings of the uh, church uh, fathers. I love the saints. And so I started in, in a mega church. You just walk in, you're a member, basically. You know, Catholics are a little more picky. Um, it takes a year of conversion classes to go through. So, um, so I was covering. So I led this dual life. I was covering um, the sex scandal during the day, talking to victims, being lied to by um, bishops and, and their attorneys. And then at night, I was going to class and just loving the Catholic Church and all its rich history and its people. And I, and I, I was able to separate those two in my mind somehow. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I, I'm going to put my faith not in, not in the corrupt um, hierarchy, but I'm going to put my faith in um, the people and the, and the church's history its, in, um, itself. And, and then I got a tip, and you, you go into you become a Catholic on Easter Eve, it's called Easter Vigil, and um, so it was about a week before that and I got a tip that this um, priest was um, going to be kicked out of ministry because he, he admitted to, in the past, he admitted to having a, um, being a child molester, molesting a kid. So I went down to the church, I sat in the back of the church, and he um, got up, and as, as these perpetrators typically do, he came out with sort of a victim-like statement. He said, uh, 19 years ago, I had a boundary violation um, with a minor, and um, because of that w single incident, I needed to step down because we have a zero tolerance policy. So I'm a father of four, so I'm sitting in the back of the church outraged that a priest would be admitted child molester and would be allowed to stay in ministry unbeknownst to anybody in the church. And he, he steps down off the podium, the whole church, huge church, rises up, gives him a thunderous standing ovation, tears pouring down people's cheeks. I was like, what is going on here? And, um, and it gets worse. Afterwards, they had a healing session with the diocesan officials in the, um, in the parish hall. And after, after some real heated dis discussions how he should have been kicked out, they, then they realized that this was going to be permanent. And so um, there was a motion to honor him by naming the parish hall after him. So it, it would have been, um, you know, father slash child molester Michael Petterich. <laughs> Um, parish hall and um, I'm just and I'm in the back I'm just in disbelief this happening and so that someone seconds it and they're about to take a vote and because I'm a trained journalist I'm looking around the room and uh, I see somebody I see someone and he's, he's got you know short cropped hair big old muscles kind of looks like me if you want to visualize and um, 
<laughs> and um, he's got veins popping out of his neck. And, and, and again, as a reporter, I'm sitting there, this is going to be good because this guy's going to blow. And so they're just about to vote on naming this parish hall after um, this child molester. And uh, he screams, top of his lungs, enough, enough. Everybody's silent. He said, I, I'm a cop. I deal with these people. Um, I guarantee you that he, this isn't, he didn't do it one time. And I have left kids with him. And the, the, the diocese didn't tell me he's a child molester. And you guys are consider yourself Christians. And not one of you has ever expressed any um, compassion for the victim. It's all about the perpetrator. And shame on all of you. You guys should all be ashamed. And he, and he walked out the door. So I was like, oh, that's, that's good. So I want to get a quote from him. So, um, so I, I start to get up, and then some woman, this is kind of an aside, but it's funny. Um, this woman in the front row um, stands up and goes, there's something even more important here. So I sit back down because you know, this is going to be good. And uh, she turns around. You've got you to remember, this is like a mob right now. They're just, the, the motion's all over the place. And she goes, what's an L.A. Times reporter doing in our midst? <laughs> So I thought I was going to be saint uh, or martyred right there, saint, saint William. Um, so anyway, so they start yelling at me, and, uh, and they say I'm going to ruin his life because it's going to be in the paper. And I said, well, he, when he molested the kid, he probably ruined his life. And then um, they said, but it, it only happened one time. And I, and I said, look, I've, I've done this story so many times that when the one thing that survivors hate is when they're discounted, when they're not, not counted by their perpetrator. And so once this gets in the paper, I'm going to get a call tomorrow. Um, from someone else because they're outraged by this and you know no no you don't know Father Mike he would never do it we know him you know um, better than you and and there I got many calls the next day from from um, victims of him um, but I was driving home from that and I was I was kind of shattered because I, I thought you know these people like probably the worst crime you can do is molesting a kid right and and so they have an admitted child molester there and these people would suspend their faculties to keep, keep keep this guy's place in their in their mind I mean there was just like no critical thinking and um, I thought well this is what the church is about you know I don't want to be a part of it so I didn't go in the Catholic Church I still cover the scandals and I and I slowly stopped going to church it, it took a it was just took a long time but I slowly stopped going to church one thing the scandal did was it um, it uh, it showed that I was a really good investigative reporter and luckily for me, um, on the religion beat, there's no shortage of things to investigate. Um, and I got a reputation of being able to do these stories. So I, um, and they just kept coming at me. I, I could not stop them. I, 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 I it was, um, it was good for me. I, I got, um, you know, a lot of uh, kudos and awards for it and everything else. But um, it wasn't really good. And I, I thought my faith was full. Even though I wasn't going to church, I thought it was for some other reason. I was like in this disbelief that I could be losing my faith. Um, one of the stories I covered is uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network. You guys know this? Uh, it's the, the woman with the um, cotton candy-like hair, pink hair, and uh, cries a lot, a lot of makeup. And then Benny Hinn's their star faith healer. Um, so, I, so I investigated them for a couple years. and. You know, I found all sorts of things in there, and, and, and Benny Hinn, the faith healer, he, he packs stadiums. He draws in, in Africa half a million people mm -hmm. who, um, you know, they have AIDS, they want to be cured. He says they can cure them. Um, if you ever want to go to um, the best Broadway show in the world, go to Benny Hinn Miracle Crusade. He he's, he's, comes around here every, <laughs> every year. Um, but it's this great, um, it's this great uh, um, production. And he tells people that, you know, God will heal you tonight. And, you know, he, he'll use me to heal you, guaranteed if you have enough faith. And uh, how do you show faith? Give you money. You know, you got to have a sacrificial gift. Benny makes $90 million a year. He, um, he lives on the ocean front in um, Dana Point, California, 13-room mansion. And um, he lives literally like a king. Um, that would be all well and good, except for when Benny walks off stage to count his money, what's left out of the camera's eye are these people with terminal diseases, hideous maladies, and they believed with every bone in their body they were going to be healed. And when they're not healed, they don't blame Benny Hinn, they don't blame God, 
they blame themselves for not having enough faith. Um, I met this kid named Jordy, he's a 20 year old kid. He's, he came down from Canada, um, to Southern California, and uh, he had a shunt in his arm. And I, you know, I said, what, what's wrong with you? He said, well, I'm, I, my kidneys don't work. But you know, Pastor Benny, Benny says, if we step out in faith, we have enough faith, um, I'll be cu- we'll be cured. And you, you know what I've done to show I have faith, enough faith? I've stopped my dialysis um, for, uh, for a week. And when you think about it, you know, it makes sense. Um, from his point of view, um, and of course he didn't get healed, and um, he, uh, I, I followed him back to Canada, and he, he got an, on dialysis, and so he was okay. But that's the kind of mentality, and a lot of people do think they're healed by Benny Hinn, and they're not, and they they stop going to the doctor, and they die. Um, so you have these these charlatans, and the TBNs, um, the way they fund their money is they it's the prosperity gospel, right? You give you give money, and God's going to shower blessings on you. Um, they tell people if you're in credit card debt, the best thing you can do is max out the rest of your credit cards, give it to us, and God will pay pay off your credit cards the next month. Um, and it's you know it's it's uh, it's bizarre, but it's it's they do it, um, and they get uh, TBN makes uh, 200 million dollars a year, and they have a profit of 70 million dollars each year. Um, so these guys didn't bother my faith, but what bothered me was the mainstream pastors that appear on TBN. They, they will not say a word about what's going on. They don't say a word to stand up for the little guys. And um, when I'd call them up to get comments, they would say, um, I don't want to get involved. Don't link me to the story. There was just a, a pure cowardice of, and this is you know, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, um, Robert Schuller, um, Greg Laurie, Joel Olstein. I mean, these are like the heavyweights, uh, mainstream pastors of America, and they they covet their TV show, which is you know a gold mine, so much that they won't um, stand up and say this is wrong. And I thought, wow, there's just you know where's the courage within Christianity? Um, so about this time, it occurs to me that my faith might be in trouble, and uh, <laughs> so. I decided to, um, and it was because of kind of this, you know, I, I thought that Christian organizations as a whole should act better than, you know, AIG or Enron. And, and um, a lot of them do, um, but a lot, a lot of them don't. And so I went and I, I was, you know, because I'm a, this, you know, awesome reporter, I thought, well, you know, I'll just investigate whether Christianity is true. And, um, so I thought one of the things I would do is I would, is I, I would look at, I said, you know, if, um, if the gospel is true, if people are made new in, in Christ and they are, um, you know, that, that they, they, the, the Holy Spirit will guide them and be better people, then the behavior of Christians should be, in general, better than the behavior of atheists in a, in a moral sense. And so I, you know, I thought I'd do this big investigation. It might take years, but um, I would do it. And it took me about five minutes on the internet. <laughs> and um, and the fact is, is that there's no difference in behavior between Christians and atheists. In fact, in some areas like um, divorce rates and um, um, racism, evangelicals are higher than atheists. Um, evangelicals give more. Um, but they're supposed to give um, 10%. They give less than three. Um, and atheists are more likely to give a bum on the street a, um, money than, than uh, Christians. So that was really disappointing to me. And, um, and for me, this is sort of like a life, uh, not life and death, but, you know, uh, I mean, this is a huge search for me because I had centered my whole life around Christianity. I couldn't imagine, this is before the Hitchens books and other books, I couldn't imagine being this godless atheist, you know, um, person because, you know, I just couldn't imagine anything worse. And um, so I thought, okay, prayer. We pray all the time. We can, we can figure this one out. We can say, let's see if prayer works. And um, again, I was going to, you know, investigate like crazy. And again, it's about five minutes on the internet. And um, there's no study that shows prayer works in intercessory, intercessory prayer works. Um, in fact, if you have a, the latest, latest studies show, if you have a heart condition, you're in the hospital and you know a whole group of people are praying for you, you do worse because you feel that pressure of, um, of the prayer. Um, and 
so that was in one of the one of the greatest studies that I saw. Because it's hard to know well, would God participate in the study on prayer? Is he gonna you know? It's, and what kind of prayer and how many? So there's a lot of variables that it's make it's very hard to study prayer, admittedly. Um, but there was a 19th century uh, guy that decided that um, because in the Church of England you pray daily for the um, health and long life of of the royal family and of their priests, then of the upper class of British society, those those two classes should have the highest uh, or longest lifespans. Um, and in fact, probably because of inbreeding, but the royalty is has a has a um, shortest lifespan, and then the priests um, have the second shortest. Um, so. Um, so anyway, any, any, any way I turned to gather evidence up that my faith was real, um, and there were a lot of other things um, there, it pointed me in a different direction, and in a direction I did not want to go, and couldn't, couldn't really um, admit to myself. Um, my last story in the Catholic sex scandal, I went to um, Alaska, and what the Jesuits who run the Catholic Church in Alaska, what they did is, um, I think, um, is when they had a really bad child molester anywhere in the world, they'd send them to these Eskimo villages in Alaska. And, um, and in these villages, um, there's, no, th there's no roads in and out, completely isolated. There's no running, even today, there's no running water in most of them. Um, there's no uh, um, police. Um, they're very, very vulnerable. They're probably the most vulnerable people on Earth, or at least in the United States, uh, but maybe on Earth. And so they put these these um, pedophiles in these villages, and, and, and other than the weather, um, it's a paradise for them because they, they run the town. No one questions them. So I went to this village in, in St. Michael. It's a harrowing 90-minute uh, plane ride from Nome. Um, and uh, this, one, um, this one monster, really, he, he, um, he raped every um, boy in that village for eight years. And... Um, the uh, Native Alaskans are very reticent people, and there's no there's no like counselors to go talk to or anything, and so these these boys who turned into men they kept quiet for 35 years, they didn't even talk to each other about it, and finally when they did, um, when the scandal kind of swept up all the way and reached them, one of them stood up and said, you know what, we're Eskimos maybe, but we're people too, and this happened to us, and they should. Um, they should acknowledge this. So they, they stepped forward. Eventually, um, um, 200 plus um, Eskimos in like 20 villages, um, um, which is, you know, it's a lot up there, um, stepped forward. And the Jesuits at first denied it, of course. Then the average settlement in, in LA was $1.2 million. Uh, Jesuits' first offer to these um, Eskimos was $10,000. Mm -hmm. Then they filed bankruptcy, so they wouldn't have to pay them. Um, so, f for me, that, that trip was the first time I thought, I love not that I don't believe in God, because I don't have to try to fit this and make sense. And, you know, where was God with these kids? Um, you know, the most vulnerable kids in the world, you know, and, and this happened for decades. Um, but I did meet one guy, Packy, and Packy was the one Eskimo that still had his faith. They, they all have lost their faith except for Packy. And um, I'll read a little bit of, uh, about Packy. Um, on my return home from my winter trip to Alaska, I stopped at Nome's Anvil Mountain Correction Center, where Packy was serving three months for assault. Sitting in a tiny visitor's room, I studied Packy's round face. In St. Michael, the Yupiks live in many ways just as their ancestors did 10,000 years ago. They harpooned whales, tracked herds of caribou migrating across the tundra, and hunted walruses sleeping on icebergs in the Bering Sea. In, the, in midsummer, they gathered wild berries, a key, a key ingredient in Eskimo ice cream, a frozen and, and oddly tasty concoction of lard, fish, sugar, and berries. I ate that before they told me what was in it. Um, <laughs> smells of the outdoor life hung heavy in the village, the salt air, the strips of salmon drying on the racks, the seaweed washed up on the beach. For now, Packy can only smell the disinfectants used to scrub the jail's concrete floors. Alcohol and a violent temper had put him here often in 46 years. Wearing a navy blue prison clothes, the short, powerfully built man folded his callous hands on the table between us. A homemade rosary hung from his neck, the blue beads held together by string from one of his village's fishing nets. All of the now-grown Eskimos I interviewed over the past week had lost their faith except Packy. I pointed to the rosary. Why do you still believe? 
It's not God's work that happened to me, he said softly, running his fingers along the rosary beads. He spoke in clipped words whose cadence matched the Yupik language he no longer understood. They were breaking God's commandments, even the people who didn't help. They weren't loving their neighbors as themselves. I didn't tell Packy about my own doubts about faith. Listening to him filled me with shame. My faith had collapsed, but he had been through much worse than anything I could imagine, raped for years by a man he believed was Christ's representative on earth, told to keep quiet by bishops, priests, and village elders, and still his belief never wavered. I asked him to tell me more. He said that he regularly got down on his knees in his jail cell to pray, an act that brought ridicule from other inmates. A lot of people make fun of me, asking if the Virgin Mary is going to rescue me, Packy said. Well, I've gotten more help from her than from anyone else. I won't stop. My children need my prayers. In the late spring, I met Packy again, this time in his home in St. Michael. He told me he recently followed the fresh tracks that a grizzly bear had made in the gray sand of a deserted beach. Packy said he could never commit suicide because it was against his beliefs, but he'd hoped the grizzly would eat him and end his misery. By then, But then, approaching some bushes where he was sure the bear was hiding, Packy had a change of heart. As he ran down the beach, he prayed to Jesus to rescue him. Packy's heart aches for the church in St. Michael. Until recently, he couldn't bring himself to set foot in it. Instead, on Sundays, he walked through his dilapidated village reciting prayers and parts of the Catholic liturgy that he'd learned from his molester. Packy included a prayer for his abuser who died in 1995. The Alaska native asked God to help his molester into heaven. I pray for Landowski for his soul, Packy says. I just want him to heal. Um, so, so I get back and my faith, I just got to admit, my faith is gone. It's just, it's just gone. And what do I do? And um, I saw a play. It's a really great play by Julia Sweeney called um, Letting Go of God. And Julia Sweeney, she used to be in Saturday Night Live. Um, and it was, and I didn't even know what the play was about. It just had God in the title. And I was, you know, on the religion beat, so I said I thought I'd see it. And um, it was like she was speaking directly to me. It was, she was, you know, smart, funny, warm, compassionate. And, and she had made peace with being an atheist. And it was, the play was about her journey. And I thought, wow, you know, she's not like this crazy, nutty person. Um, she's kind and compassionate. And she kind of looks like a Christian, you know, um, the better Christians. Um, so I had to stop, I realized I had to stop wishing what were true and just facing, for me, what was the truth. And um, it, it took a while, but, but once I did, um, I'll read you, I have two more little readings here. Um, I started to see that the miracles of my Christian life had rational explanations. My born-again experience at the mountain retreat had been about fatigue, spiritual longing, and emotional vulnerability not being touched by Jesus. I began to attribute my personal and professional turnaround to maturity, not to guidance from God. Landing the re religion writing job of the Times is a product of years of hard work and persistence, not divine intervention. I had changed in another way. I now saw that belief in God, no matter how grounded in logic and reason, requires a leap of faith. And either you have that gift of faith or you don't. It's not a choice. I used to think you simply made a decision to believe in Jesus or not, collect the facts, and then decide for yourself. But it's not that simple. Faith is something that is triggered deep within your soul, influenced by upbringing, family, friends, experiences, and desires. It's not like registering to vote, checking a box to signal that you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent. Christians often talk to those who have fallen away from the faith as if they had made a choice to turn away from God. But as deeply as I miss my faith, as hard as I try to keep it, my head could not command my gut. I, I now know that it was wishful thinking, not truth. I just didn't believe in God anymore despite my best attempts to hold on to my beliefs. Faith can't be willed into existence. There's no faking it if you're honest about the state of your soul. So I come to this conclusion. I wait a year, and, and I asked my, after a year, I, I asked my editors at the Times if um, they'd mind write, if they'd mind if I wrote about it. And they sensed a good story. They didn't care that, <laughs> they didn't care I was going to pour my guts out for the public to see. And they said, yeah, go ahead and do it. So I wrote the story. I thought it was going to be vilified um, when, it, when it first came. When it, there's a moment in journalist life where the story's done, edited, and there's nothing you can do to get it back and before it published. It's like, the, it's, like um, it's just hell because you're, you're, you, you keep like, a, I'm an obsessive compulsive person, so you keep going over every fact, everything. And there's nothing you can do. It's already gone, but it's not out yet. And uh, so in this story, I just thought, God, love Dale, how stupid can you be? You didn't have to do this. You volunteered for this. People are going to hate you for it. And um, my, um, my compassionate wife, as I'm tossing and turning, she goes, 
why should you worry about? There's nothing you can do. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Um, so I got up. I looked in the. Um, I looked online. It was. It had just been posted about 30 minutes ago. And it was there. It, it was a hideous picture of me. That was the worst part. Um, but it felt like okay. It's out there. What can I do? But I still all hyped up. So I. Um, I just absentmindedly checked my um, email at work, and in in the the screen holds about 30 emails, and it was four screens filled of emails. And I'm just like, oh crap, that's like the worst thing. Um, but then I look in the subject line; it's congratulations, thank you, um, religion. People that write about relig religious stories, they're the most vicious letter writers in the world. Um, but this, these um, over a hundred of them, and there was one negative one, and everybody was um, thankful that someone um, who, who's not uh, anti-theist like um, Hitchens or Dawkins, but someone who um, um, likes religion can write honestly about doubt. Um, this is, doubt is not a valued um, commodity within um, Christianity. Jews, another story. <laughs> but. Um, Christians, you know, Christians or is, uh, Muslims, you know, you, you, you don't doubt and you don't seriously doubt. And so I got the, so I ended up getting about 3,000 emails, um, by far the most in the Times history. Um, and uh, for people basically just thanking me to, about writing about doubt. Um, and, um, and churches, oddly enough, are, the, are my biggest um, uh, group that I speak to now because they want they want to hear about it they want to hear how they can drive someone like me away but they also want to hear about about doubt um, so I'll, I'll just end up with this last reading um, what the what the Bible promise promises peace and serenity I found in larger measures as a non-believer my morals and values haven't changed I used to see my innate beliefs about right and wrong as something God given I now see them as a product of tens of thousands of years of evolution encoded in my DNA to best ensure the survival of my family and myself. A sociopath, not an atheist, has no conscience and no ability to tell right from wrong. As a believer, I try to live up to the standards for living outlined in the Bible, that is, the generous and loving parts of Scripture. Nothing has changed since my loss of faith. I still try to follow the same general ideals, morals, and values that I'd argue are inherent to each human being. I still find myself stumbling, but now I don't blame Satan. I usually when I usually do, usually when I do wrong, it's due to selfishness, poor judgment, overcoming common sense, self-restraint, and experience. Truth be told, my actions aren't much different than when I was a Christian. Many of my basic life struggles are the same. I still worry too much, hold grudges too long, lie, usually in small ways, too easily, drink more than I should, am too impatient with the kids, etc., etc., etc. What's gone is the placebo of faith that was supposed to transform me into a better person, to protect me, to guide me, and eventually to usher me into heaven. The placebo had stopped working long ago, and when I admitted that I'd been taking the sugar pill of faith, relief swept over me. My increasing doubts about Christianity hadn't been a sign of weakness or lack of faith or skirmish with the devil. I'd only been slowly, even unconsciously, headed for the truth. So what has taken the place of God in my life? A tremendous sense of gratitude. I sense how fortunate I am to be alive in this thin sliver of time in the history of the universe. This gives me a renewed sense of urgency to live this short life well. I don't have eternity to fall back on, so my focus on the present has sharpened. I find myself being more grateful for each day and more quickly making corrections in my life to avoid wasted time. I've tightened my circle of friends, wanting to maximize time with the people I love and enjoy the most. I have become more true to myself because I'm not as worried about what others think of me. This may be in due in part to maturity, but it also has to do with knowing what's of real importance in my one and only life. The sound of a clicking the sound of a ticking clock counting down the minutes of my life is now nearly impossible to get out of my head. This isn't a bad thing. It's the background beat to a well-lived life. So that's it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, did I see Doubt, the play or the movie, and what I think of it? Um, extraordinary movie. Um, it's uh, right on with um, how things work in the Catholic Church. Yeah. You said you, that you're not anti-theist, right. and yet you've seen the ugliness that religion can bring. 
I'd be interested in how you can, why you still not, why you still aren't not anti-theist. Why, why aren't I anti-theist when I've seen all the bad that religion can do? Because I've seen a lot of the good. I mean, it's, um, uh, churches are uh, by far the biggest private charity in the United States. Um, without, without, what, without them doing what they do, I'd argue that people would pick it up um, in other ways. But right now, without them, um, you know, the, the society would collapse. Um, so I see the good. I see the good at how they um, treat uh, the disenfranchised and the poor and things like that. So I, I think it's way too simplistic to say, you know, religion is bad. Um, or, you know, um, you know, all of it is bad. It, it's a balance. I haven't, unfortunately, read the book or your columns, and this isn't a push for any specific religion, but have you reported on other faiths, like, say something like the Baha'i faith, which might look at Christianity as you have and say, yeah, 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 but there's an explanation for why some have gone off the strange end there. Yeah, I've reported on... Um, on all the major faiths, um, you know, once once sort of my beliefs uh, collapse that there is a um, personal God that intervenes in someone's life, um, my my belief in in every faith system, even that it doesn't have that, sort of collapsed as well. You know, I, I think we're, I mean we're the only animals that know we're going to die, and I think that. Um, that's a great incentive to um, have this uh, concept of heaven and, and um, you know, uh, this loving Father that's going to take care of us all the time. You know, I, think, I think once we come to grips with um, death, then a lot of that falls away. At least it did for me. I'd be interested in having you explain a bit more about how you did research on the difference between Christians and atheists. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of studies out. Um, where did I get the research, the difference between Christian and atheist? Most of the research is done by, um, by evangelical Christians that are um, appalled that they don't act better or differently than society. Um, there's a good book called um, The Scandal of the Evangelical... It's not the mind, because that's another book, but um, and he lays it all out there, and it's, and it's all these different studies by um, mostly Christian organizations, and they're trying to figure out why don't they act differently. Well, do you know, do they do this by question, surveys? Surveys, yeah, surveys, a large surveys. I noticed, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I noticed glancing through that you, uh, toward the end, you, you mentioned Pascal's wager and and contrast it with Occam's razor, which you can gloss if you like. But uh, something I've no, haven't heard anybody point out is that the the, um, the the end times believers are basically asking the world to accept Pascal's wager in reverse. They're saying, "But well, effectively, oh yeah, we're we're trashing the planet, but it doesn't matter because because uh, you know it's almost uh, midnight." Yeah, you know, I, I they're really I, dangerous. They're they're it, really dangerous to everybody in the reality based community. Yeah, I think I think you got to be careful in that. I, I I think that the number of like there's a huge um, green movement now within the evangelical community, um, and there is a lot of backlash towards um, the people that are on the fringes, but that can that um, that that get the most time in the media. And so, you know, I think those those folks are real fringe people that you don't need to worry too much about. Except if they're in the White House. <laughs> Except yeah. Okay. Have you considered how much difference it would have made to you if you went through all these experiences except for the sex scandals in the Catholic Church? How important was that in your transformation? Um, how, how important was the um, Catholic Church sex scandal in my transformation? Um, it was large. Um, it really opened um, sort of this floodgate of doubt. Um, but if it were, if um, I think it was just the catalyst. If if it wasn't there, uh, a lot of people ask me, would I have lost my faith if I wasn't a religion writer? Um, I always say I'd hope so because I think I've found the truth. Um, but it would have taken me, you know, decades as opposed to, you know, I had a real concentrated dose of um, faith. And, um, and so if the, if the Catholic Church scandal wouldn't have happened, um, I think I, I, I saw enough on the beat anyway that I think I would have 
been doubting it wouldn't have been as, as quick. So either as a, an investigative journalist or as a, in response to Churchill's invited you to speak about your book, have you found any that share in your struggles and in your uh, recognition of how important it is to ask hard questions and to doubt and who recognize Jesus as one who probably did a lot of doubting himself mm -hmm. and challenged a lot of human um, sinfulness or separation from love. Yeah, and, and if I found um, if I found a lot of churches that um, sort of embrace this notion of doubt, and um, uh, you know, I think that um, I think the churches on the far right, and not like the far far right, but just you know, um, and and on the far left are the ones that do that because they they act like their faith is real. Um, there's a there's a big middle mushy group of Christians that I think are um, are really cultural Christians. I don't think they really believe what's in the gospel, um, and um, and I think that's why you know doubt's very dangerous to them because you know they don't really believe deep down. And I th the latest study came out uh, two weeks ago now, but it, the, the number of uh, people that say they have no religion in, in the United States has is, is doubled in the last 20 years, 19 years. Um, I would bet you that it has doubled in the last five years. I think um, the battering rams of um, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, I think they have allowed people to sort of come out of the closet. Um, I get, when I speak a lot, there's um, there's always one or two people that are um, that want to tell their family that they no longer believe, but they it, it's kind of like you know 20 years ago when people were gay, they're just like my family's going to disown me, um, I can't come forward, I'm living this life that's a lie, um, but the but the churches on on the far ends, they don't have any of those problems, um, or lo most of them, and that that's where I'm getting the invites from is the 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 real conservative Christians and the real um, liberal ones. Provoked by the Holocaust, are you acquainted with the group called uh, to call themselves Jews without God? And if so, what's your comment to that? Um, Jews that are, um, yeah. I, 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 let me just uh, Jews that are um, that are sort of cultural Jews. I, I'm not familiar with that that particular group. Yeah, the, I mean, the, every faith, he's talking about, um, you know, after the Holocaust, there's, there's a group called uh, Jews Without God. And um, there is, you know, in, in, the, in the Mormon faith, um, it's estimated that 30% of the Mormons are what they call Jack Mormons. They, they, they don't believe a word of, the, um, of Mormonism, but they would be ostracized from, from society if they come forward. I, I know a lot of ex-Mormons who have come out, and they are, in fact, um, ostracized like you wouldn't believe, whether it's your career or your family or your school. Um, it's very, very um, disturbing. Um, so I, I, think, I think a lot of us, you know, uh, do that. And they just, and they, and they like, I think people stay within Mormonism because they, they like, it's kind of a nice culture, um, family friendly, everything else, but they don't necessarily believe it. Do I miss my faith? Um, not when it's quiet in the dark. When it's when when I'm, I have like the stomach flu and I'm throwing up and I want to uh, I want it to be over. Um, you know, I've actually said a couple prayers. Like, look, look at if I'm wrong, you know, um, please uh, please stop my illness. Um, yeah, I always think if you know if I was on that plane that landed on the Hudson, you know, would I be praying? You know, I don't know. Um, uh, I hope not, but uh, you know. The flesh is weak. Uh, did you, you probably did, study the history of how doctrine and liturgy was handpicked, developed on, decided on by all the council, right. and how did that affect your uh, feelings for what the core belief is presented as? Um, question is, um, have I studied the way the, the um, 
scripture and, and uh, liturgy uh, um, has developed over the centuries and how that affected my belief. You know, I think the more you look, for me, the more you look into, um, and this is just Christianity, uh, Christianity, the more you see man's fingerprints all over it. Um, and I, I had read, when I first became a Christian, I read all Christian apologetic books because I, I want to be able to defend my faith. And so, and there's some powerful, um, very intelligent Christian apologetics or apologists, um, uh, but I never read like the other side. Um, and so once I started to read the other side, I thought that their arguments beat out the, you know, the C.S. Lewis's and, and, and others. They were the biggest jerks in the world. <laughs> now, um, uh, yeah, how did my family take this, uh, this news? Um, I, um, uh, I, I, I think well, my mom's here. I, th I think my mom's disappointed um, that we haven't really talked about it. Are you disappointed? <laughs> Okay, that's a lie. She said whatever makes me happy. Um, and then, um, but I have, you know, I had a, um, not in my side of the family, I will say, but I had a uh, relative that called me up and said uh, the reason why my son um, was diagnosed with um, type 1 diabetes is because I stopped believing God and lifted, um, lifted his protection from my home and allowed Satan in. And then he added, he's not a mental um, giant, he, and then he, uh, he added that it's, it's also the reason why my um, younger son has chronic ear infections. So I thought, you know, what kind of God is that? You know, chronic ear infections, is that all they can come up with? Um, so, um, and I've lost, you know, some friends, but not very many. Most of my friends I've kept. Um, but, uh, oh, and my, my mother-in-law won't talk about it. She's a, um, a good Catholic, and she actually ended up reading... Um, she secretly, I don't know how she even knew it, because she never, she's never talked about the book, like it doesn't exist. And um, so she secretly got a copy somehow, and she read it, and she's so upset that she had to go talk to her priest, her Catholic priest, <laughs> who told her it was an evil work and, uh, you know, just don't read it. So, um, so it's caused some, some stuff, you know. My Christmases will be better, because they won't be over. Um, for us. <laughs> Last question. Last question. Do you still think that Jesus actually existed? Do I still think Jesus actually existed? Um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think he uh, I think he probably did. I think um, you know, I think I think he probably existed, and then he was you know kind of became sort of a, a legend. If you look at you know, there, there's only one contemporary reference besides the Gospels. To Jesus, and it's just a passing reference. And if what he was doing, you know, these miracles and this, um, you know, everything that was going on in his in his life that was so spectacular, I would just think there'd have to be some other references what to reference are you, are you uh, Joseph. Josephus? Yeah, that was much, that's a whole separate subject. But okay. 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 That's that's it. Thank you very much for coming.